This work is in collaboration with many folks. Uh, in particular, I just want to highlight Sertesh Karaman was a big collaborator on the robotics work here. Um, and then Joel um, Emmer was a collaborator on the uh, more deep learning side of things. Um, and so why do we want to work on efficient computing for these particular applications? Uh, so even though we're very excited about AI and robotics, right now a lot of the computation that happens for these applications um, happen on the cloud. Um, and there's many compelling reasons why you want, might want to move it out to the edge. So the first thing is communication. So if you really want to make these technologies accessible to people around the world who may not have such a strong communication network or infrastructure, you want to move, be able to move it out to the device itself. Um, another reason might be for privacy reasons. So for a lot of applications, uh, for example, healthcare, uh, you might want to keep the data private on the device. You might not want to share it with the cloud. So processing near where you're collecting the data is important. Um, and then finally, for today's talk, we'll focus mostly on uh, latency. So for a lot of applications where you interact with the real world, latency is very critical, right? So for example, in self-driving cars, if you're driving down the highway, you want to avoid a collision, you might not have enough time to send the data to the cloud, wait for it to process, and then come back and you know, stop the vehicle. Uh, so latency is very critical for a lot of these interactive applications. Now, it's fine to want to move the computing into the robot or the edge itself, but one of the greatest challenges there is actually computational power. Um, so if we take a look at this article from Wired back uh, last year looking at self-driving cars, in self-driving cars they're collecting you know, gigabytes of data every uh, few seconds or every 30 seconds, and it takes over 2,000 watts of power just to process that data. Right, so this is nothing to do with actually, just the computational power to process that data and make decisions about the data is quite significant. As a result, there's a lot of wasted heat and they have to spend a lot of effort actually cooling these particular devices. And of course, they also take up a lot of space in the vehicle itself. So this is an existing challenge already for self-driving cars, which we're more familiar with. But if you uh, take a look or think about the robots that we shrink down, there are smaller robots that actually consume less than a watt of power for actuation. So these miniature, or what we call low energy robots, you might find these for uh, applications like miniature aerial, aerial vehicles, like in Harvard they're building these RoboBees, uh, lighter than aerial, aerial vehicles with blimps, for example, or you know, deep space exploration with miniature satellites, or even uh, software foldable robots. And so here, actuation is very low, so even more so computing is very uh, critical and could be dominant. Um, and so when you shrink down computing into these very small, small form factors, uh, typically the limitation on the computation is as follows. Uh, first, you can't afford to have very large batteries on the, these small devices. Um, and then secondly, typically the power budget you would have for computing on these smaller devices or these low energy robots is under watt. But existing embedded processors that people will typically use for these applications like robotics and AI are consuming over 10 watts. So there's an order of magnitude gap in terms of the power consumption um, that you have for computing on these particular devices. Um, so what people have done in the past to address this problem is just simply wait. And why is that? Because we have Moore's Law, right? So what Moore's Law and Denard Scaling uh, used to give us is that it would enable general purpose processors to become faster and more efficient over time. In fact, every, you know, every 18 months or so it would improve. Um, but what's been recently happening is there's been a significant slowdown in Moore's Law and Denard Scaling has ended. So in fact, if you look at some of the benchmarking work that people have done um, last year on general purpose processors, they've only sped up by about 3%. So if you extrapolate that, it would take 20 years to get the next 2x of improvement. Right? So really, we can't rely on transistors to be more efficient anymore. So wait, what do we have to do? Well, we have to start looking at designing specialized hardware to in order to give us the energy efficiency and the speed that we require for these uh, emerging applications like robotics and AI. Um, and really, what we need to do is redesign the computing hardware from the ground up. And so uh, John Hennessy and uh, David Patterson won the Turing Award last year for computing, and this is also something they really emphasize the need for more do domain-specific hardware to uh, bring the area of computing forward. Um, in our group, we want to open it up even more. So if you're going to think about designing new hardware, you can think about redesigning the whole stack and think about cross-layer optimization for efficient computing. So first of all, you can start from looking at the algorithms and applications. How can we make these algorithms much more hardware friendly? We can start rethinking about the algorithms. Now that you don't have to map the algorithms to a CPU or a GPU, if someone was saying, I'm going to just give you a completely new custom hardware platform for you, how would you rethink your algorithms um, for those particular applications? So how do you make your algorithms hardware friendly? Uh, of course, we need to design new 
uh, computer architectures or hardware architectures, so things like thinking about the memory hierarchy, how you want to place your memory and distribute your compute, um, and also the circuits that are involved with that as well. Um, and then finally, you want to think about how you might incorporate all of this computing into the systems as well. So the ultimate goal is to make the system energy efficient. So you want to think about the interplay between the computing, the sensing, and the actuation, for example, in the robotics space. Okay, so we're kind of really trying to look across all these typical layers of abstraction to really address um, energy efficient computing. Um, so if you're going to redesign hardware from the ground up, the first question should be, well, where is the power going, right, if we're going to focus on reducing power? And so as it turns out, the power is actually dominated by data movement, right? So what does that mean? So that means that you're going to spend more power moving data to a compute element like a multiply and add than you are going to do that, for, do that multiply and add. So if you look here, shown in the blue, um, is basically how much energy you would consume doing different levels of precision of multiplication and addition. Um, and so, you know, ranging from 32-bit floating point to 8-bit multiply, you can see you're in the, you know, uh, 3.7 picojoules and below. But reading from a very small on-chip memory, even 8 kilobytes of on-chip memory, which is very small, is going to take more energy than doing that 32-bit floating point multiply. And of course, that gap's going to be even more if you look, use lower precision arithmetic. And if that memory, if we need larger memory, particularly if you need gigabytes of memory, you typically will need to go off-chip so outside of the processor, let's say reading from DRAM access. And then we're talking about orders of magnitude difference in terms of the energy consumption. So I just want to highlight that this is on a, a log graph or an exponential graph. So this is significantly higher than the other approaches. So really the challenge when we're thinking about you know, designing new hardware, designing new systems for computing, what we really need to focus on is dealing with this data movement and data movement properties. And the challenge is that if we think about the applications that we carry out, for example, autonomous navigation, they often require a lot of data, right? So for example, just looking in the vision space, if we care about semantic understanding, which is basically assigning labels to each pixel in the image to so say whether or not this pixel belongs to the ground or the sky, um, you often have to explain, spend a lot of processing on high frame rates. So you want to you know, process the images very quickly to react to changing environments. You might also need large resolutions so that you can see very far away, so small objects that are far away can react to them um, sooner. Um, and then if you want to be able to, let's say, support you know, multiple scales, you might need to do things like uh, using a, generating a pyramid. So there's data expansion here, and this can be two to th uh, one to two orders of increase in the amount of data that you have. So for example, in an HD image, you have two million pixels. This might become 200 million pixels if you generate this pyramid. So that's a lot of data to process. And this is per frame, and then you have to multiply it by your frame rate. Um, another area where data grows is also geometric understanding, so understanding the geometry around you. A typical thing here would be like a map, for example. So as you kind of travel further, the size of the map grows and you need to store it somewhere. Uh, so in general, if you want you know, robust and long-term kind of navigation, you're dealing with very large amounts of data, a significant component. And so the challenge is we know data movement is expensive, but now we need a lot of data to do these applications. So how can we go about doing that? Um, so one of the first things we want to look at um, when we're talking about autonomous navigation is the task of visual inertial uh, localization or odometry. So for those of you who are not as familiar with this, more with the hardware background, basically what that means is you want to determine basically your location and orientation in a given space. So you know, before you can decide where to go, you have to figure out where you actually are. Right? And so a typical way of doing this is taking in a set of image sequences and measurements from an IMU, so accelerometer and gyroscope, and infusing it together to get an estimation of where you are in the 3D space. Right? So you can imagine here this is just the visual data coming in, and we're estimating where we are in the 3D world from this. So that's the localization aspect. Uh, and then if you're in an unknown environment, you might also have to generate a map. Um, and this is typically used for uh, autonomous navigation, but you can also be used it for uh, augmented reality and virtual reality as well, because you need to tell you where you're looking at. Um, and if you're f familiar with the concept of SLAM, this is a subset of, of SLAM. Um, so this, is in this work is in collaboration with Surtesh Karaman. So what we uh, wanted to do is actually build a chip to be able to do uh, uh, visual inertial odometry. So this is the first chip that we called Navion that does this, this complete visual inertial odometry. So on the front end, uh, from the visual data that we're getting from camera, we're doing feature detection, tracking, and outlier elimination with RANSAC. Um, we're also processing the IMU data, so that's the accelerometer and gyroscope by doing pre-integration. Um, and then we're going to fuse both the visual data and the IMU data um, in the back end with a pose graph. 
Okay, and so that's all being done on chip here. So you can see like the feature tracking and stuff. Are, this is the chip itself that we have. You can see the feature tracking on the chip, as well as the stereo and so on. So this chip is four millimeter by five millimeters. So you can see that it's quite small, so it can fit on these very small, you know, nano drones. Yep. What type of features are you extracting? Uh, correct. So we're basically corners. Corners. So there's like, uh, you know, good to track features like edges and corners, and you can track them across. Uh, the different frames, and that kind of gives you an idea in terms of where you're moving, uh, direction you're actually moving. Um, so here's the chip itself. Um, and so one question we often get is, if you're going to make this very low power, under 25 milliwatts, this is also going to be very slow. Um, so in fact, this chip also runs at a camera rate of up to 171 frames per second, and it updates its pose graph at 90 frames per second. And so when you compare it to a mobile CPU or a desktop CPU, you're talking about two to three orders of magnitude more energy efficient. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question here. Right, so this in particular, if you're thinking about kind of like these very small scale robots, you can consume under a watt for actuation, right? So it depends, the, the amount you spend on actuation depends on the size of the robot and the weight of the robot itself. So this, what I was saying is I was about to say is that um, it doesn't matter if it's 25 milliwatt or um, that's a good question. So in this particular case, if we look at this, this is probably about a watt or two watts for actuation, then it won't really matter so much. Right. What is the quality of the inertial unit impact the data rate and the amount of processing you have to do with the camera? Um, that's a good question. So the, the IMU, you usually get data much faster, but it's lower dimension. And so actually the pre-integration is to summarize the data like so they can match the key frame rate of the uh, image data itself. So it's fusing the two of it. So the, you know, the idea of the, like multimodal fusion is to kind of eliminate, eliminate any, um, how should I say, like mismatch between the two sensors, right? So they complement each other, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the case that you might want to do cross-layer optimization with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you're doing? Yeah, so I won't talk too much about that, but in the RSS paper for this, we talk about things, for example, that we use a two-point ransack as opposed to a five-point ransack, because it turns out some elements of the five-point ransack are very hard to implement. So that would be one example of the cross-layer design. Um, and some of the other work later, I'll talk more closely about how we do the co-design itself. Any other, this is a great question. Any other questions? Okay, so how do we make it actually this efficient? Uh, so the first thing is that it should be no surprise you guys want to reduce data movement and the data size. So in particular, we want to have a fully integrated system and put them all on an actual device. Right together, and so we don't want to have any off-chip processing or storage because we know that moving data on and off-chip was very expensive. Um, but if you want to integrate everything on-chip, there's going to you have to make sure that it's very compact, right? So for example, in the front end, we do low-cost frame compression to reduce the cost of storing the frames, and then in the in the back end, we exploit sparsity in both the graph and linear solver. Right, and so overall with exploiting compression and exploiting sparsity, we reduce the memory down, size down to under a megabyte, so about eight, 854 kilobytes of storage. Okay. Uh, very briefly, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of what we do for each of these components, um, and then I'm gonna move on to the next thing. So in terms of the storage, the compression for the frames, what we actually use a very simple four by four block uh, lossy compression on the frames, and we have to keep this logic very simple because we don't want the savings of com or the cost of compression to outweigh the savings that we get. We get. So basically, what we do is we break this image into four by four blocks. We find the minimum and maximum, which is the dynamic range. We quantize the steps within the dynamic range, and so something like this becomes something like this, and this gives us four x compression. Um, this is what we would call. I guess it's cut off a little bit at the top. This is what we call uh, compressing dense information. Um, another type of information we want to compress is sparse information, but this is sparse but structured information. So this is the Haitian memory um, and the linear solver, and we can see that all the black locations indicate the non-zero non location, so we can see it's very structured. Um, so you can easily basically half the memory side first by exploiting its uh, diagonal symmetry, so you only store you know, one of the triangles, and then you exploit this structured sparsity to get another 5x reduction of the overall size. Um, of course, you can also exploit this sparsity uh, for increasing your throughput or your processing speeds. So you get about 7.2x by only processing the non-zero values. And again, the key here is that you need to have very simple logic to recognize the sparsity. Otherwise, it you know, blows up your space. So these are relatively straightforward. I'd say that the most challenging part, actually, is dealing with the factor graph memory. This actually accounts for 80%, over 88% of the overall memory on chip. 
Uh, the challenge with the factor graph memory is essentially what you're trying to store are the feature tracks, right? So let's say you have these four keyframes. You have to track certain features across them. And you can see that these tracks can begin at any time and end at any time. So it's very unstructured. It's very sparse, but very unstructured. Right? So that becomes much more difficult to manipulate. If you were to store you know, all worst case scenario and just like not adapt to the data structure itself, you'd need about almost a megabyte of uh, storage. Uh, but what you can actually do is break this into a two-step storage. So you actually do uh, basically the keyframe and the pointer storage at the first level. And this is very sparse, but each element is very small. And then you have pointers to a very dense memory here. And each dense point actually has a lot of data stored there. So you make it a two-step thing. And actually, this gives you about a 5x reduction in storage costs. Okay. Um, the other thing that's important to mention is that we're building specialized hardware here, but you actually still want to have some flexibility in your hardware. In particular, you want to be able to configure it so that it can adapt to different environments. Because obviously, some environments are easier to navigate through than the others. And so when it's easy, you want to basically be able to trade that off for either speed or energy savings. Right? So we have this Navion chip in 65 nanometer, but we have over 250 configurable parameters in the hardware itself to, so that we can adapt it to different environments. If we run it at the most highest performance, highest configuration, we're looking at, as I mentioned, up to 171 frames per second and up to 90 frames per second for the back end. This is on the Euroc data set. Um, we're consuming uh, 24 milliwatts, and we have a trajectory error of 0.28%. Um, but if you really configure the parameters for each of the different sequences in the Euroc data set um, to really minimize the energy, you can drop the energy consumption down to 2 milliwatts without sacrificing any accuracy. In reality, so the configuration here is really important as well. Okay, um, any questions about this before I move on from Navion? Okay, so this is basically some of the work we did for the visual inertial odometry. So once you understand where you are, the next step for navigation is understand what's around you. Um, and some typical things that you want to do to understand your environment would be things like depth estimation to sort of figure out you know, how far this pixel or this object is from me. And also, as I mentioned, uh, segmentations or semantic segmentations. So you want to be able to assign labels to each pixel in the image itself. Um, it should be no surprise to you guys that currently you know, the state-of-the-art approaches to do these involve using deep neural nets. The challenge for deep neural nets is it requires 700, several hundred millions of operations and weights to do the computation, if not billions these days. And so if we compare it to another type of image processing that we widely use, which is all of your phones, which is video compression, this is going to be orders of magnitude, two to three orders of magnitude, more complex than video compression. And so the challenge is, can we make you know, doing these type of neural nets, make it as efficient as video compression? Because then it can truly be ubiquitous. These days, if you have an image sensor, usually you'll be able to do video compression behind it. So for that same cost, um, in terms of area and energy, can we do uh, neural networks or uh, computer vision? Um, so, and of course, computer vision, when we talk about neural nets, it has a wide range of applications beyond computer vision, also speech recognition, gameplay, and so on. So this broadly applies to many of these fields. Now, when you think about neural nets, I know you guys didn't really raise your hand too much about neural nets, but the main thing that you want to take away from neural nets, what dominates computation there, is just a multiply and accumulate. That's like the main function there. It accounts for 90% of the complexity. Right? So if you have a bunch of multiplies and accumulates, the thing is they can actually all run in parallel, a lot of them. So high throughput is actually possible. Right? And that's why you know, GPUs and stuff do it. Um, I've been very friendly towards it. The main challenge, actually, which is a, you, know, you can see this theme, is the memory access, is the, really the bottleneck. How do we deliver the data to the compute unit or the multiply and commute, uh, accumulate unit? Right? So just to give you an example, if you have an ALU that has a multiply and add, um, you need to have three reads. So you have to read the filter weight, the image pixel, or if you're deeper in the network, this is also called a feature map um, activation, and the partial sum. And then you need to write an updated partial sum. So it's a four to one ratio in terms of memory access to compute. Furthermore, in the worst case scenario, if you read these uh, weights and, or this data from DRAM, each of these memory accesses would be 200 or two orders of magnitude higher in terms of energy than the compute itself. So if you take AlexNet, for example, with a, which has 700 million multiplies and accumulate, it, take a, it takes a billion memory accesses to do that processing. And for a more advanced modern CNN, it's the same kind of ratio. Okay, so this is one of the key problems. 
Um, but again, there's some things that we can exploit, in particular, put data reuse, right? So there's a lot of opportunities for reusing the same data for multiple computations. So for example, um, a typical type of neural net that we would use for visual data is convolutional neural nets. And one of the key processing features there is convolutional reuse. So we're going to convolve a high dimensional filter with a high dimensional input image. And the idea here is that the weights and pixels that are used in this convolution are going to be repeated, just in different combinations. So you can reuse a lot of that data in the convolutional processing. Um, also in deep neural nets, you tend to apply multiple filters to the same image to generate multiple output channels. And so that means that each pixel in the image or each activation in the feature map can be reused multiple times across the filters. Finally, we typically want to process more than one image at a given time. And so that means that each weight in the filter can also be reused multiple times across different images as well. Okay, so there's a lot of um, exciting reuse opportunities that are inherent in a neural network. And so the question is, how do we exploit it? So one way that we can exploit it is to build an architecture where we have a very small memory um, in, next to the ALU, next to the compute unit. By small, I mean very small, like under a kilobyte of storage, of a storage cost. And why? Because smaller memories tend to consume less energy. They have less capacitance. And you want to keep close by because you don't want to move it very far because, again, you want to reduce the amount of capacitance you're switching. Um, and so what you would have is you would, could build a memory hierarchy as follows. You have very... If, if an ALU, a multiplier and accumulator, is 1x, reading from this very small register file, this very small local memory of 1 kilobyte or smaller is also going to be 1x. Reading from some of your neighboring processing elements, you might have an array of these processing elements, is going to be 2x the power. Reading from a shared global buffer, which is a larger memory, 500k bytes, let's say, is going to be 6x the energy. And then going to DRAM, as we said, is the worst. And so the idea here is that we want to exploit the data reuse. We want to, as much as possible, store the data in this very small memory and use it as much as possible. Right? But we have these very large neural nets of like millions and if not billions of weights and activations. So what can we do? So what we need to do is we need to break up those very large neural nets into small pieces so that we can store them one by one into this register file. And the real question is going to be, what is the order by which we should be processing these different components of the neural net so we can maximize data reuse, so we don't have to keep on moving data around? Um, and so this has been an area that people have explored for a while in terms of, well, when I say a while, the past few years for neural nets. Um, so we've classified them into a couple ways of thinking about this. So one is what we call the sta weight stationary approach. Um, and the idea is follows. These people who are doing you know, this type of approach want to really minimize the energy consumption for weight data movement. So they're going to store this weight in the low, very low cost memory. So the weights have very low energy because it's always going to be read from the small register file. But the trade-off is that the pixel information and the partial sums have to move through the network and from the larger memory. Another strategy is the output stationary strategy that says, well, the weights I only read, but the partial sums I have to read and write because I have to update and accumulate it. So it's better that I do make the outputs stationary and store the partial sums within the small memory and have the weights and pixels move around instead. That's another trade-off. Um, a third approach is something that we did in my group. I'm not going to go too much into details, but the key idea is as follows. What we actually want to do is we want to balance the data movement for all data types, not just weights, not just partial sums, not just inputs. And so can we exploit convolutional reuse within a processing element by processing one row at a time within a PE? Right? So then we're going to exploit convolutional reuse between the row of filters shown here in green and the row of inputs shown here in blue. Um, and they also maximize accumulation of the partial sum within the P itself. So it all happens with that very low cost um, register file. And so this is 1D, but of course you can expand it into multiple dimensions to handle um, you know, the 2D convolutions and the high dimensional convolutions of neural nets. Um, one thing I want to emphasize here is if you look across this array of processing elements, the feature maps are repeated horizontally, which means that I read once from that more expensive global buffer and I use it multiple times horizontally. And then similarly, diagonally in blue, the uh, feature maps are reused horizontally, or diagonally as well. So I read the feature map once and I reuse it diagonally across the whole array. And again, the overall takeaway from this is that you want to minimize the overall energy efficiency of all data types as opposed to one particular data type. Um, and then this is going to be present in the results as well. So this is somewhere we published at ISCA. And we show a breakdown of the energy consumption of these different strategies. So in the weight stationary approach, you can see that the green part shows that the weight data moves the least. And so the weight energy is very cheap. 
but the red portion, which is the partial sums, and the blue portion, which is the pixels, is, becomes much higher. Output stationary, there's sort of obviously actually different variations of that. You can see that the red portion, which is the partial sums, is very small, but the green and pixels are higher. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about the no local reuse, but that's another strategy, but clearly not as good. And then row stationary really focuses on minimizing all the overall energy consumption. So really, you get about, about 1.4 to 2.5x 2, uh, 2 reduction in energy consumption by really optimizing the order of data processing and what you're moving and what you're not. OK, and so we realize this um, in an actual piece of hardware called IRIS, the Rose Stationary Data Flow. This is in collaboration with Joel Emmer, uh, also at MIT. Um, so this is the IRIS chip. It has like this array of processors that we see, and we've fabricated a chip. This was published at ISSCC back in 2016. Um, just to give you a feeling in terms of the reuse that we have, um, by exploiting data reuse, we re reduce the amount of memory accesses from this global buffer by 100x and from DRAM by over uh, 1400x. Okay, and then when you compare it to, um, at the time, an NVIDIA TK1 uh, GPU, which was fabricated in 28 nanometer process, and this is 65, so it's an older process that we're using, um, you get over an order of magnitude reduction in terms of the energy consumption. Okay? Um, and so if you want to know more about IRIS, we also have a project website on that. But in general, what we're showing is you can dupe deep neural networks in under a third of a watt in real time. Um, but then let's take a step back and look more from the application's point of view again. So if I'm only building a system, I actually don't care about the details, how you built your hardware or what algorithm you're running. I actually care about the trade-off between accuracy and energy. So let's look for an object detection test. This is a trade-off between accuracy and energy. Um, there's many ways, many types of algorithms that you can run to do object detection. Um, one, of course, is like the neural net based stuff. Uh, so AlexNet, VGGNet are two different types of neural nets that can be used for that. And so this is the iris chip. But also, you could also use the handcrafted feature approaches, which basically means, you know, an expert comes in and says like, oh, look for edges and so on in the image. And this was state of the art before the whole return of the neural nets in 2011, 12-ish time frame. And so we can use hog features, histogram or integrated gradients. And so what we actually did in our group was we um, had two students build chips. These are two PhD students within my group. They're both in 65 nanometer CMOS technologies. And as much of a control experiment I can do, these students started their PhDs at the same time and graduated their PhDs at the same time and taped out in the same time. So tried to keep it as a controlled experiment. Um, and so we get energy measurements from this. So look at the, let's look at the comparison. So, so from an accuracy point of view, we can see that obviously AlexNet and VGG, so deep learning gives two to three X improvement in terms of accuracy. And that's really great. That's, I think that's why people are very excited about this field, right? But then if you look at the vertical axis in terms of energy, you see something quite more drastic. So just to give you a baseline, video compression is around one nanojoule per pixel. Okay, so actually it's very interesting. Histogram of oriented gradients, um, this is using a DPM model, we can achieve lower energy than video compression. So for the same energy you spend on compression, you can actually identify objects in the image. Um, but if you want to have higher accuracy of that, it actually t takes two to three orders of magnitude higher energy to go do that. So I, you know, I could ask you guys a question, which is that, let's say on your cell phone, I give you an app that gives you twice or three times the accuracy, but it's going to basically use up your battery 300 times to 10,000 times faster. Is that something you're interested in? Right? Probably not, right? So we can see that energy is really important. We need to address that if we really want it to be widely used. And so even with specialized hardware, there's going to be this gap, let alone if you don't have specialized hardware. So we have to do some other things to close this energy gap. And so there's been a lot of people looking at the problem. So not just ourselves, but like many, many people out there. There's a very thriving area of research looking at both how do we redesign the algorithms and the hardware to enable energy efficient uh, deep learning. And so we spent some time back in 2017, really, and I mean, continuing now, to look, you know, generate some survey and overview material on this. So if you're interested in getting some knowledge on this topic, I encourage you to look at um, these slides that we have at ISCA. We're actually doing a new tutorial at ISCA this summer. So if you're attending that conference, you might be interested. And then we have this overview paper in the proceedings of IEEE. And this is just really to give us a sense in terms of what, what is going on in this field, what are the approaches people are using. And what was really interesting was when we did this survey, we found out that there's several limitations to the existing approaches, um, which I'll just highlight some of them right now. So the first thing is all of this work on efficient DNN algorithms. So what do people do in general? You can very loosely cluster them into three classes. One is network pruning. The idea is you want to remove some of the weights 
right? You make the weight sparse. Anything times zero is zero, so you can skip those operations. You can compress the information. Um, some other thing in our compact network architecture. So rather than using this big 3D filter, can you decompose it into a 2D filter, you know, spatially, and then also one going within the channel direction? So SqueezeNet and MobileNet is a strategy. Another thing is reducing precision. So rather than doing 32-bit float, can you go down to 8-bit or even 1-bit? Um, and so the issue is a lot of these works really focus on reducing the number of operations, the number of max, and the number of weights. But as a systems person, actually what we really care about is reducing energy and even latency. So the question is, does this translate? When I reduce maximum, does this translate into energy savings? Now if you think back of what we just said a couple minutes ago, data movement is what really dominates energy consumption. And so what really dictates um, energy consumption is how it moves through the memory hierarchy and what kind of memory hierarchy it has. The data flow really affects it. So what does that mean? That means all weights are not created equal, all operations are not created equal. It really depends on how the data gets to that operation. Right? So you can't just say, I'm going to reduce the number of weights, and it's going to be more energy efficient. Uh, so with this information, what can we do? Well, what's a good way of estimating the um, energy consumption? So within our group, we built out a framework to basically take in some different DNN shape configurations or different sizes of DNNs, as well as uh, information about the weights and input data, including their sparsity, and then kind of figure out what the optimal data movement would be across the memory hierarchy for this type of neural net. We would get a breakdown of the energy cost. And if you're interested in that, we made the tool available publicly on our website. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that it shows that the number of weights alone is not a good metric for energy. Okay, and this should be of no surprise. If we look at a breakdown for, let's say, Google Net, you can see that the weight data movement is only 22%, but the output feature maps and input feature maps also account for a significant portion of the energy consumption. So just because your neural network is small doesn't mean it's going to be more efficient. So you really, this is like the same lesson as we saw when we're looking at the deep, uh, neural net hardware is that we should account for all types of data. Um, so what can we do to address this? So one strategy is how can we really take energy into account when we're designing or redesigning the algorithms for neural nets? So for example, in the task of pruning, meaning removing weights, in the past what people would do is they would remove weights that are small. Okay, so we call that magnitude-based pruning. And you can see here, this is the energy cost. You can see that magnitude-based pruning can be very pretty effective. You can basically half the energy by doing that. But just because a weight is small doesn't mean that it consumes you know, a lot of energy. So in fact, what you want to do is you want to remove the weights that consume a lot of energy. And we know that the more weights we remove, the lower the, the more the accuracy will drop. So you want to get the biggest kind of bang for your buck. You want to remove the uh, weights that consume the most energy. One way that you can do that is you can sort the layers in terms of which layers consume the most energy first and start pruning those high energy layers first, right, to get the best bang for your buck. So that's one approach that we took. And this is what we call energy aware pruning. And you can see by doing that, you get another 1.7x reduction in the overall energy consumption. This is all holding accuracy the same. Okay, that's really critical, or within 1%. But the main takeaway message here, and if you, well, if you want access to the prune weight, that's on our website, but the main takeaway here is that if you want to do this co-design of algorithms and hardware, you really need to consider, in the design of the algorithms, the real metrics that you care about from a systems level point of view, which is energy and also latency. Okay? Um, this is fine because we use that energy model that we developed for IRIS, but in practice, you might not have energy models for all the systems that you care about. So for example, if you're a Google, who we collaborated on with this project, you might have to build neural nets for a wide range of embedded platforms. So how can you automate this process? So this work, NetAdapt, basically takes this into account. So what it does is it basically automatically adapts a pre-trained neural network for a mobile platform and targets latency or energy. And what does it do? Rather than using an energy model, it takes empirical measurements from the actual platform to guide the optimization. So you start out with a pre-trained network, so the way it's already trained for a given task. Um, you generate a bunch of network proposals. You measure, the, which are basically small changes to the network, shrinking different parts of the network. You evaluate this on the platform. You see which ones go either faster if you care about latency or lower energy. You feed that into the NetAdept algorithm. It might have a budget in terms of the latency and energy requirements that it have, and you iterate through this. And you gradually tighten the budget, um, and so eventually you'll have an adapted network. Okay, and just to show the impact of this, this is for 
um, an image classification test, particularly on a very small neural network itself, so the mobile net. The key thing we want to show is even for a neural net that's already very small, we can further improve it. Because you can take very large neural nets like AlexNet that's very old, and that's really easy to shrink. But for a small neural net, it's much more difficult. So we use this very small neural network. And we look at the trade-off between the latency, so this is measured speed on a Google Pixel phone, and accuracy, this is top one accuracy, so higher the better. So up and left is there in this image. Um, and then you can see that if you just do kind of hand scaling of the mobile net itself, shown here in green, um, it's not as efficient or morph net, but if you use NetAdapt to really take empirical measurements to come in to drive the network design, uh, you get these red dots here, and you can see it gives a much better accuracy versus energy trade-off. So for example, you can keep the same um, accuracy, but have like a 1.7x increase in speed. So again, this is another way of doing it. But again, the take-home message here is that if you're going to do co-design, you want to use you know, true or direct metrics in the design of your algorithm if you want to realize real improvements in energy and throughput. Um, so this is on an image classification task. I just want to mention that you know, image classification task is fairly easy. Right? I give you an image, and you give it one label at the output. So you can think of it very much as reducing information. So you can imagine how it's easier to kind of shrink it down. Uh, a more challenging task would be something like depth estimation. And this is more relevant for robotics in the case where, where you want to take a very you know, simple RGB Im image, which is very passive, um, and then, which doesn't require acting for depth estimation, and then try and predict what the depth of the objects are. Right? And this is going to be much cheaper than using a depth sensor where you have to actively send out a laser or a pulse and wait for it to come back. Um, but to do this type of thing, you often need an autoencoder. And so what is that an autoencoder? Uh, you have basically a reduction set, an encoding layer, which is reducing from images to a label. So this is very similar to classification. But then now you also want to expand the data. And the output is actually a depth output. We have basically labels for every pixel indicating you know, the depth of every pixel. And so you can imagine this is going to be more challenging to reduce in terms of network simplification because you need to preserve a lot more information. Um, so we wanted to see if uh, NetAdapt would work on this, as well as some of the other approaches that we've done in, within our group. And so in fact, indeed it does. We applied NetAdapt, some compact network design, and depth wise decomposition uh, for depth estimation. And we can see here in this graph, um, so on the bottom here is frames per second, and on the horizontal or for vertical axis here is the accuracy. This is the delta one. So this is the, what is the percentage of pixels that are within 25% of the correct depth. Here, upper to the left is better. And so you can see that basically you can preserve, you can be pretty close to state of the art in terms of accuracy at you know, 10x faster. Um, so this is some work we're going to be presenting at ICRA in two weeks' time. And this is on a Jetson TX2 GPU. Uh, we use a batch size of one because we want it to be low latency. And we still kept it at 32-bit flow. So you can imagine if you reduce the precision here, you can go even faster. Um, and this is all on the Fast Depth uh, website. Um, OK, so that's from the algorithm point of view. Very briefly, though, I also want to mention one of the phenomenons that happen is that with so much excitement in this field, a lot of algorithms are being generated. And then the challenge from the hardware perspective is that now we need to uh, build more flexible hardware, because there's no guarantee as to what algorithm is going to be run on your platform. So again, even though you want to build specialized hardware for DNNs, it still has to be flexible. Right? And so this is one of the challenges faced because you just support all these different functionalities if you really want to make these more efficient. Um, I won't get into too much of the details, but this was the focus of the second version of the IRIS, which we just published at JetCast. Uh, and really, the, the key things are we want to be able to efficiently support a wide range of filter shapes, both the large and compact filter shapes. So in terms of trying to find data reuse, you need to be very flexible there because you know, the number of channels, for example, would not, not be the right way of finding reuse. Uh, we need to be able to support different layers. Uh, and so this is an example of some results on mobile net. This is the speed on mobile net. You can see it basically uses many different types of layers, point-wise, depth-wise, fully connected, and so on. You can get an order of magnitude speed up. Um, you also want to support sparsity, dense and sparse neural nets. Um, you also want to be scalable. I think an important thing from a hardware standpoint is if I give you more processing elements or give you more memory. You should be able to go faster and be more efficient. So the designs, the decisions you make should be scalable. So because of this flexibility, it can also scale up. And you can see when we increase the number of processing elements, it will run faster. Uh, and so overall, it's an order of magnitude faster and more efficient than the first version of Iris. OK, so that's the neural net side of things. And so any questions before I switch to robotics? Yeah. Correct. 
So I would say that some of the aspects of inference or testing also help training, right? So the main what are the main difference of training? The main difference of training is that um, you need to store the activations during backprops. So you need more storage. Um, and then also precision. So we haven't we didn't do much work on precision, but other people have done work on precision. But in general, you can't have, it's much harder to have low precision for the gradients, although there's research in that space. So those are the two things that I would say you need to consider if you also want to do training as well. But the aspect of data movement and so on holds for training as well. So you can think of the, the kernel is similar, and you want to reduce data movement there. But thanks, that's a great question. Any other questions? Later? OK. So this is all neural nets. And then let me just move beyond neural nets. OK, so um, the next thing, once you figure out where you are, what your, what your surrounding are, is then the next thing you want to do is figure out where to go next. Um, and that really depends on what your objective or task is. So we took the task of robot exploration. Um, so basically, if you're put in an unknown environment, how quickly can you explore that environment to learn the most of it about that environment? And we can just basically use uh, Shannon's mutual information as a, as a way of deciding where to go next. Right? So what part of the map will give me the most new information to reduce the uncertainty of the map? Uh, so again, this is work with Sirtesh. Um, so what are the key steps? So you, first, you might want to select some candidate locations that you want to go to scan the map. So this is what we call an occupancy map for the hardware folks in the room. Um, so the bright or the white part is the place where you're not occupied. The dark lines here, which, which are the ones which is where you know there's an obstacle or you're occupied. And then the gray part is the unknown. So you want to kind of discover, reduce as much unknown as you can, right? Um, so you might want to scan. You can imagine scanning over here, scanning over there. Those might be candidates. One way of deciding which one to use is to compute the mutual information. So you can imagine, in this example, the bright portions are the places where you actually want to go and you get the most information. Um, and then once you pick a point, you actually go there. You scan it with a depth sensor. I should emphasize the range sensing. And then you can update your occupancy map. So this is a key challenge. Now, in the past, people have avoided using Shannon's mutual information because it's very computationally expensive, even, even though it's a principled approach. Um, but we're going to show how we can actually compute that efficiently through both co-design of both the algorithm and the hardware itself. Um, just to, again, reemphasize what we're doing. So you start out with an occupancy grid map, and you want to compute the mutual information. Um, and so what happens is you, you have a certain amount of uncertainty or entropy in your uh, map, this mutual information will help reduce the uncertainty and give you an updated version of uncertainty of the map stuff. So that's why we want to compute this. That's the main objective. Um, OK, so what are you trying to compute? Actually, you're computing the channel mutual information between the beam, like the range sensing, and the grid, the cells on the actual map itself that the beam will intersect. Um, a typical, if you go directly uh, to compute the channel's mutual information, this would be the equation. The challenge in this aspect is that there's no closed form solution for this portion of this integration itself. Right? So as a result, they need to use numerical integration with a resolution of lambda z. So the complexity is going to be O n squared lambda z. Okay, this is pretty standard. This was done in 2014. Uh, uh, I would say this, I think that this is with a Gaussian assumption, but I could be. I think it, there's, okay, I don't know exa exactly. I will leave that to Sir Tesh to answer, but I think I think certainly for this part, the Shannon's mutual interest is for arbitrary distribution. So I think this should also be for arbitrary distributions. Um, so the idea here is that we can do Shan uh, fast Shannon's mutual information. The idea is as follows. You can reorganize the way you compute the data. So rather than computing the mutual information per cell, uh, you can actually compute multiple cell, like multiple cells all together and accumulate all together. And actually by rearranging it, you can actually remove this numerical integration. And so now the complexity is only O n squared, right? And then you can do a simplification. So if you use Gaussian, for example, you can do a truncated Gaussian. This is also done in the CSQMI work from Vijay Kumar here. So you can truncate it, and that further simplifies uh, your uh, complexity to O n. OK, so this is um, going to be published at ICRA again uh, two weeks from now. Um, so in summary, you have the complexity of, so original MI is o, uh, ON squared lambda z. You have FSMI ON squared, CSQMI ON, and then approximate uh, FSMI also ON. Um, if you measure the speed of these, uh, these are measured result on a Xeon core, just to translate this complexity to actual measurements, you can see you get three orders of magnitude savings from FSMI from original MI. Um, and then when you use this uh, Gaussian 
uh, truncated Gaussian, you further drop that, and for approximate FSMI, as it turns out, you get another about 2x speed up compared to CSQMI. It just works out in the equation that you happen to get this additional gain. Um, and then, of course, you run it on a small embedded processor. So this is the ARM CPU core on the TX2, not the GPU, just the CPU core. Um, you also get um, somewhat savings of FSMI versus CSQMI. Uh, so the main summary is using approximate FSMI gives you over an order of you know, 1,000x or three orders of magnitude savings compared to original MI and about 1.7 to 2.8x faster than CSQMI. Okay. Um, so how does this work in practice, actually on an actual race car. So this is showing a race car, a mini race car itself in the motion capture room. This is in Sertesh's lab for localization. Um, it's basically pan planning the path with RRT star and it's choosing the path that gives the most mutual information. So it's going to pick the green path and you can see it's trying to go to the place where uh, this is the mutual information that it's calculating. It's trying to go to the bright part of the mutual information surface. Okay, and so what is this setup itself? So this is, again, in his motion capture lab. It's going to go to the green path with the most MI uh, per meter, and this is completed trajectory. Um, and if we look at the plot per, of the entropy of the map versus time, you can see that um, CSQMI and FSMI perform approximately the same. Um, the compute time is actually approximate FSMI is a bit faster than CSQMI, but in practice, because of the small area, um, the search is both the same. But the key thing that we want you to take away here is it's uh, possible with approximate FSMI to basically reduce entropy at the same rate as CSQMI uh, with computing directly the Shannon's mutual information. So you need, don't need a proxy for it. You can go directly for Shannon's mutual information. So the original assumption that it's very complicated to compute mutual inf Shannon's mutual information, I hope this debunks that, that it is possible to compute in an efficient way. Okay, so this is algorithmically the changes, but also what I'm very interested in is obviously the hardware side of things. And so for the hardware side of things is can we compute it faster, especially if a larger map with this more complex you need to go faster. So if we take this approximate FSMI equation, if we look at it, it's embarrassingly parallel. Like there's so many summations. It should be able to, just like neural nets, go really quickly, right? Um, so high throughput should be possible on multiple cores. In particular, if you're doing a scan with multiple beams, each of these beams can run on a different core, for example, if you just assume independence. Of course, that's an assumption. Um, and then you can just add the values of those different cores together. So there's a lot of parallelism that's available here. So this, in theory, should be very fast. But in practice, one of the key challenges is data movement. So that's like the theme of this talk in general. Right? How do I get the data to these compute engines? Right, even though I can run these all parallel. Um, in particular, the power consumption of the memory often scales with the number of ports. And typically, if you want a reasonable SRAM power consumption, you're limited to two ports. So what does that mean? That means that if you store your occupancy map in a memory, which is what you're going to do, you're going to be limited by reading only two things from that memory at a given time. But I want it to have n parallel cores running in parallel going very quickly. Right, so how do I resolve this? This is really going to be um, the issue that I need to fix. You need to have some arbiter, first of all, but even still, you're going to have some issues. So again, the key takeaway or the myth I want to debunk is that data delivery, specifically memory bandwidth here, limits the throughput, not the compute itself. So even though in theory I can compute all of them, I can't get the data to all of these engines to get them to run at the same time. Okay, so what can you actually do? Well, we can build specialized memory architectures by looking at the specific memory access pattern. So shown here are like the beams radiating out, and the numbers are basically um, the iterations of the cycle at which I'm going to be accessing the different blocks of the occupancy map. And so what I can do is I can actually break up this occupancy map and store them into multiple memory banks, which is basically store them into different memories. And then as a result, I can access more data at a given time. But then the question goes, what parts of the map should I put in what part of the memory? Right, that's the big question. Um, so that I can minimize conflicts between all the different cores. And you can imagine how the cores are each of these beams. And so one way that we found was using the diagonal banking pattern. Right? So the idea here is that each diagonal of the map here is stored in a different memory bank, which is basically, in all intents of purposes, a different memory. And then the key idea here is that you'll see that, in terms of time, the same number only can repeat once, or you can only at most two, see the same number twice for a given color, meaning that for any given time, each memory bank is only read at two different positions, or two, there's only two cores reading from at a given time. Right? Um, so this is where some work that we're going to be presenting at RSS this year. And so by doing that, what can you achieve? So let's just take a look at the experimental results. 
So if I only had one memory, shown here in blue, even if I increase the number of cores, the throughput would not increase at all, because I can't get enough data to all these cores. Uh, if I use vertical banking, you can do reasonably well here. But if I use the diagonal banking that we selected, and vertical banking means that each row has its own bank, or each column has its own bank. If I do uh, the diagonal banking, you can see in yellow you do much better. We also do this thing where we pack multiple pieces of data in the same memory address, and that shows you here the purple that does even better. Of course, you also need an arbiter that basically says, if there is a conflict, how do I handle it? How do I prioritize? That's also built in, but I don't have time to discuss that. But the key takeaway here is that with the specialized arbiter, banking, and packing, we can significantly improve uh, memory bandwidth or improve the throughput to the extent that we're within kind of 6% of the case where if you had unlimited memory bandwidth, this is how you would do it. So it's almost as though you're not limited, even though you're, you are actually limited to two ports, but it's just how we pick up the data. Um, another thing is just in terms of how is it actually performing. So each core itself on the FPGA, this is a single core, and this is for different uh, lengths of the beam. Uh, you can see that you get an order of magnitude speed up for each core in the FPGA itself, it's just a single core. Um, and then if you can compute more locations of FSMI at a given time, you can see the trajectory length was going to reduce. But in summary, if you brought this all together, basically what we're able to do on this FPGA is you can compute the mutual information of the entire map. Right, so for every single position of the map, you can figure out what the mutual information is. And this map is a 20, by 20 meter by 20 meter at 0.1 meter resolution, so 200 by 200 uh, positions in under a second while consuming two watts on an FPGA. And currently, we're looking at putting this on an ASIC, and so you can imagine it's another going to be order of magnitude reduction in terms of power consumption. Right. Um, OK, so that's for these 2D spaces and the hardware for that. Um, finally, the one last thing I want to mention is we also want to look at extending it into 3D, right? So um, often you're dealing with 3D information. It's going to require a 3D map is going to require a significantly more amount of computation and storage, right? Um, one way that people have been trying to address this is they compress the 3D map with Octomap into a smaller set of data. And so one question we want to ask is, can we extend FSMI so it can operate on this compressed data? Because right, if we need to uncompress it, again, it's more data movement, more storage, going to be more cost. Um, and so, OK, so you can. So basically, this is the compressed format. You basically, if you look in the 3D space, it's a kind of a ray tracing algorithm going through. And you'll see that as you're tracing through, there's going to be a lot of repeated data in the map itself. So in this one ray trace, the colors represent different, uh, the, the same values of the occupancy maps. You can see a lot of repeated things. And so what can we do? Well, we can actually compress, keep this in the compressed format and compute the run length encoding, use run length encoding format to do the FSMI computation. So in an uncompressed format, you have your beam length is n. Uh, your approximate FSMI, as we saw before, is on. But if we compress it with run length coding, um, the actually the, no, the length of your uh, complexity is going to be proportional to the number of segments that you actually have, right? The number of runs that you actually have. Um, and so the uh, complexity is going to be O and R. And R is going to be much smaller than N because that's the number of unique segments you actually have. Okay? Um, and so how does this work in practice? Again, so just um, in terms of the complexity, it's like uh, go, changing all of your Ns to NRs, right? Which are N, NR is much smaller. Um, and so if we use, first if we use synthetic data with different degrees of compression or repetition, you can see that there's a significant acceleration. These are measured results, acceleration on the processing itself. Um, I should mention that we just put the, if you're interested in this, the archive paper we just put online yesterday. That's just appeared online. Um, but then in practice, this is a video that we took of this actually, again, working in Suratash's lab. Um, so we're doing the race car here. Again, this is the side view. This is top level view. And you can see, um, so this is a little bit hard to see, but basically the red paths, or so the yellow, uh, green paths are the paths with most MIs. You can see at this one point, it's quite interesting. It goes backwards because it's trying to scan the top level of the objects to get more information about the top level. So it's going backwards to so they can see more and fill in more uncertainty there. Um, and so in practice, by doing this, um, for this uh, real lab, we can achieve a compression ratio about 18x with an acceleration of 8x. All right. This very one, very last thing, I wanted to talk not just about compute, but about sensing itself. So we talked a lot about depth sensing. A typical thing people might do to do depth sensing is like time of flight, you know, with the connect. We talked about you can do um, DNNs, but the question is, can we further reduce how often we 
you know, use the sensor, not just completely turn it off. Um, one way is to use computer vision techniques with a passage image sensor. So you can collect depth and image information, let's say for time one. And then what you can do is turn off the depth sensor for time one and time two, and then just try and predict these depths using temporal correlation between the images, um, as well as the correlation between RGB and depth. Um, and the key thing is that in computing the correlation, that has to be very lightweight, because again, you don't want that to overcome uh, the cost that you save from reducing the sensor on time. And so we can run this algorithm on a Cortex-A7 in real time, which is a very small processor um, that you might find on a phone or even a microprocessor itself. And just to give you an idea about the quality, here's the RGB image, here's the ground truth depth map that you would get with a Kinect sensor, and this is the estimated depth map. So here we're only keeping the laser on for one out of every nine frames, and the rest of the time we're turning it off, and then we're interpolating and estimating what the depths are for all the other frames, and we have mean relative error relative to ground truth about 0.7%. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff, but the, the key things I wanted you to take away from this is as follows. Um, efficient computing is really critical for advancing the progress of autonomous robots, uh, particularly small-scale robots where actuation is not as high, but computation is really important. Um, so it's a critical step to making autonomy um, ubiquitous. Uh, if we're going to meet the real-time demands of power and speed for hardware, we need to redesign the computing hardware from the ground up, and we really need to focus on data movement, both for both reasons, right? So we show example where we want to use reduced data movement for improved energy efficiency, and also improve data movement for keeping all our cores busy for high throughput. Um, and then specialized hardware really opens up a lot of new opportunities in the co-design of both the algorithms and the hardware together. So as I mentioned, a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Surtesh, and really we're trying to think through how do we th rethink about algorithms, how do we rethink about hardware, and it's a much bigger design space than looking at these independently and also can have a bigger impact in terms of energy throughput um, and so on. So we think that this opens up a lot of innovative opportunities for the future of robotics. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we covered today, so if you want, like, I put these slides on our website, so you're welcome to also take a look at them at your own pace. Um, and then if you want updates in our group, we also have a Twitter feed. And then I'd be remiss if I don't acknowledge all the students who did a lot of the work, obviously, in this area. So these are the students in our group. Um, I collaborate with Joel Emmer and Surtash Karaman, and then all of our sponsors. Um, so with that, I'll take any leftover questions you guys might have. Thank you for